you can't get the full picture of something when you just look at individual parts. So especially things that are complex. When we're talking about how the human body adapts and responds to stresses like exercise or how it adapts to nutrition, for example, the human metabolism is, is probably the second, mammalian metabolism is probably the second most complex thing we've identified in the universe besides the, the human brain. So when we're trying to identify like how the body adapts to exercise and nutrition, all that stuff. There's a multitude of factors. To get a full picture, you can't look at one study. You can't look at two studies. You have to look at a lot of studies. And you also have to consider the opinions of experts who've been working in a particular field like that for yeah. decades. And you have to take all of that and then you might get- See how it all interacts and with then, each other. That's yeah. the, and that's still not far enough. And then no. you have to account for behavior and psychology of people. So much. Boom, we're back. Mind pump time. Here's the giveaway for today's episode. Map Strong. This is a strongman-inspired workout program. By the way, if you don't want to be a strongman, doesn't matter. Great program. Builds lots of muscle, lots of posterior chain work. One of my favorite non-bodybuilder style type workout programs. And you can get it for free, but you got to do this. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If you do all those things and we read your comment and we like your comment as the best comment, we'll notify you and you get free access to Map Strong. One more thing. We got a sale going on this month. We have a workout program bundle that's 50% off and we have an individual program that's 50% off. Here's what they are. The starter bundle includes Maps Anabolic, MAPS Prime, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide. Now, that bundle is normally discounted, so what we did is we took an additional 50% off, so it's a huge sale. And then the program that's on sale is MAPS Split. This is an advanced bodybuilder-style body part split routine. High volume. It's great for body sculpting, bodybuilding. If you're advanced, it's a great workout program. That program is also 50% off. So if you want to sign up for either one or both, go to MAPSFitnessProducts.com, click on the one you want, and then use the code MAYSPECIAL for the 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. All right, so I'm going to start today's fitness tip by reading a proverb uh, to all of you. This is an Indian proverb, and uh, believe me, this actually applies very strongly to what we're going to talk about. So here's how it goes. A group of blind men heard that a strange animal called an elephant had been brought to the town, but none of them were aware of its shape and form. So out of curiosity, they said, we must inspect and know it by touch, of which we are capable. So they sought it out, and when they found it, they groped about it. The first person whose hand landed on the trunk said, this is like a thick snake. For another one whose hand reached its ear, he thought it seemed like a fan. Another person whose hand was upon its leg said that this must be a pillar, like a tree trunk. And then the blind man who placed his hand upon its side said the elephant was a wall. Finally, one of them felt the tail and described it as a rope. Um, and one of them also felt the tusk thinking that it was a spear. So what does this have to do with uh, with fitness? Can I tell you something? Two things. One, I've never heard that before. Isn't that cool? Two, I love you. Because <laughs> I, I know exactly where you're going with this. This has to be related to our forum little discussion that totally. happened. Totally. Yes, totally. So, so okay. So, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a ancient proverb because essentially what it's explaining is that you really, you can't get the full picture of something when you just look at individual parts. So, especially things that are complex. So, this is a simple thing. It's an elephant, but they're right. blind and all they know is how to touch. And so, each person comes and gives their contribution. Well, when we're talking about how the human body adapts and responds to stresses like exercise or how it adapts to nutrition. For example, human metabolism is is probably the second mammalian metabolism is probably the second most complex thing we've identified in the universe, besides the the human brain. So when we're trying to identify like how the body adapts to exercise and nutrition, all that stuff. There's a multitude of factors. To get a full picture, you can't look at one study. You can't look at two studies. You have to look at a lot of studies, and you also have to consider the opinions of experts who've been working in a particular field like that for yeah. decades. And you have to take all of that and then you might get- See how it all interacts and with then, each other. That's yeah. the, and that's still not far enough. And then no. you have to account for behavior and psychology of people. So much. You have to factor that in because that we're, we're, that's ultimately what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. So you have to paint the rest of the picture of this and explain uh, what happened in the forum where we were kind of going back and forth and- you, uh, we had a kid. I don't remember his name uh, in there. We should call him out because for, for, <laughs> for that reason, uh, made a comment about the programming, and I knew right away 
um, without him even saying any further, like who he's following on social media, because yeah. there's a lot of people in our space very smart guys, very fit guys, very experienced guys that love to use studies to make debates and arguments all day long mm -hmm. on on why this is better than that. Yes. And now here's here's a big issue is that in in our space you have like different camps of people who form different opinions. And one of the camps uh, are the like the is the study camp. And I, I do want to be very clear. Studies are extremely valuable um, ways of uncovering the truth. They're not the only way because we're talking about something that's very complex and studies also can be... It's an amazing resource, but it's only like that one small piece to the puzzle. Well, they could be very limited. For example, when you look at a study, there's a few things that you want to consider, like the, the sample size is important. So how many people were in the study? Let's say it was 10. 10 people and we divided this into two groups and we tested two different training modalities. The odds that two or three of the people in one of the groups had like superior muscle building genetics is higher because it's a small sample size. So what if that happens? What if one what if one group had one guy with like bodybuilder genes, which are super rare, right? But let's say there's one guy on one side, and then you do the cumulative, you know, at the end of it, the results, and you go, Well, wow, this method built way more muscle than this method, right? So that's sample size. Okay, and then you can add in this, is that it's in a controlled environment where they're running it for six to 12 weeks. And another factor plays that 90% uh, of the population wouldn't consistently follow that or do that. Right. Because behaviorally speaking, yes. which doesn't take an account in that study. No, that's, that's where you get like the experienced people who go, like, you know, here's an example. Like, what if there was a study that said, it compared like, uh, like 10 different forms of cardio. And they said, out of all these forms of cardio, uh, the one that burned the most fat was swimming in a lake at 5 a.m., right? Okay, what is that worth? Nothing for most people. Most yeah. people aren't going to go swim in yeah. a lake at 5 a.m. For cardio, yeah. the most effective form is the one that you're going to do most consistently, right? That's what an experienced uh, coach would say. Um, another one is who is in the sample. Look at the studies, especially fitness studies. 99% of them, or I, I, maybe that's too much, but I'd say a vast majority of them are college-aged males. Do you think the results could change if it was women or if the age group was different? Look, I've trained people for, for decades. If I trained people between the ages of 20 to 30 versus 40 to 50, uh, is it, am I going to get the same results? Are yeah. training modalities going to change and which one's going to be more effective and what I need to focus on more on this group versus that? That's a big difference. Yeah, the methods applied, is it repeatable? You know, yes. Can you take that same study with a whole new host of different uh, applicants and it has the same result? Like so, this is, that's what science is trying to really discover is like, you know, how many times does this uh, uh, a result happen within this controlled study? You're right. And another one is the length of the study. This one's interesting for fitness, right? So let's say it's a 12 week study and let's say they're comparing um, a leg press to a barbell squat. And they take, uh, let's say, 20 college-aged males with some fitness experience, which we don't know what that really means, but usually it means that they've they've done sports or something in the background in, in the in their past. And they compared leg press to, to barbell squat, and they said, "Oh wow, look at this! Uh, in 12 weeks, the leg press built two percent more muscle, or was equal. Let's say it was equal. Here's the problem with that. The problem with that is that a barbell squat is a far more technical." exercise. It requires more skill. And this happened to me all the time. When I would train people, especially new people, especially beginners, it would take me two or three months before we could do squats in a way that built muscle because yeah. it's a high skill exercise. Now, leg press, I could sit someone on it. Load it right away. Yeah. Almost right away. Or within two weeks, I could start pushing weight. So you're not getting a full picture. Uh, now, in my experience, just using the same example, barbell squat over time, over years and years and years, just keeps giving you returns. Mm -hmm. Whereas a leg press, yeah, you you get some returns initially because it's easier to learn, but then it starts off. to slow down. Whereas the squats continue to you know to kind of have that that payoff. Um, another one is controls. W what if we don't control their protein intake? <coughs> Does protein impact how much muscle we build? Or what about sleep? Yeah. What about you know stress? You know all these different things. And what if the study was observational or survey based? We surveyed, you know, fifty people who work out, yeah, yeah. asked them what they're like. 
So, so these are the things that you want to consider. Now, I'm not saying that again. Yeah, studies they report aren't. their own diets. Like Dude. it's like you know how inaccurate that is. Having clients like how they would report like just oh I forgot about all these things. Oh my I god, have written down. You're not getting the full picture. And so so when you look at a study that says this isolation exercise builds as much muscle in the quadriceps as this compound lift, and okay, that's one study. Maybe you found two or three like that. But consider all the stuff I said, and then don't ignore. The what you're going to hear from people who are experienced, who've actually worked with people for years and years and years. Because what are we all considering? For example, I'll give a great example. Here's why I like full body workouts over splits for most people. The main reason, if you work out th your body, your whole body three days a week versus doing a body part split, I know over the next year, two years, three years, the average person is going to miss, you know, two workouts a month, let's say, three workouts a month. Right. It tends to be the body part they don't want to work on. Now, if you miss a full body workout, you're still hitting your full body. Yeah. And so over time, the full body workouts, one reason why they tend to be more successful is you don't you don't end up with these lagging body parts because of your- It addresses everything. Yeah, it addresses yeah. everything. So this is the stuff that we need to consider- <laughs> And, you know, again, when you're, when you're passing, making these judgments, especially, let's say, you're, you know, this is a hobby of yours. You like to read studies and listen to this. And that. <laughs> you, you know, here's what happens. This happens to a lot of kids, too. This There's is a lot the, of people that hobby. These days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what it is, is it, today it, it's and it's so prevalent today yes. in comparison to 20 years ago, because now anybody can get on YouTube or Instagram yeah. and follow a couple people that claim to be experts. Dude. And now all of a sudden you think you're an expert. Or you, yeah. <laughs> especially if it confirms your bias. Of course. Of course. If, you're, if you're a kid and you're like, I just want to build a lot of muscle. And then you listen to Mind Pump, you're like, oh, I got to squat and deadlift. Like, I can't really do those well. Those are hard. Yeah. I got to work on mobility. Then you listen to some other guy who's like, no, man, the, you know, the, these exercises build just as much muscle, muscle, leg extension, hack squat. They're better for hypertrophy, and, actually. Yeah. And in fact, it's, you know, you're like, yes, I don't have to do all that hard stuff. And I only want, I really only care about <laughs> how I look anyway. So you get that confirmation, you know, bias that's going on. So you got to consider all that stuff. And when you're talking about adaptation, I'm telling you right now, it is very complex. Um, also the other thing too, is that there's like general truths, but when you break it down to the individual, it's not always true because we're yeah. so different. Everybody's so different as individuals. And to be more specific to the, the, the person that we're addressing or the conversation that we're addressing, that's, that was the, the, the thing was that, uh, the maps programming is subpar for hypertrophy. Uh, hypertrophy. And the reason why they think that is because, and they're referencing some of the Instagram people out there that do the post of these exercises are better for hypertrophy than these compound lifts. Yeah. And the case that we've been trying to make on the show, which I mean, when, when someone debates this, I'm like, you obviously haven't listened to that many, that many episodes because I feel like we've addressed this before. A hundred times. Yeah. We've, we've gone over why, why that is. And it's because the big bang that you get for your buck for, with compound lifts in comparison to that yeah, all the stuff yeah not just hypertrophy right you you have to factor all those other things in there it's not that simple like a control a controlled study and then therefore oh okay i'm gonna skip doing barbell squats and all i'm gonna do is leg extensions and leg press now because those are technically better I'll, for hypertrophy. i'll give you i'll give you a great example if you talk to a uh, like an instagram diet you know influencer about how to lose lose the most amount of weight in 60 days and then you listen to one of us talk about how to burn body fat. You're going to get two different answers. Hmm. Why? Because one person is, what they're worried about is how to get you to lose as much, as much body fat in 60 days. We trained people for a long time. I don't care about how fast you lose body fat. I care about if you can keep it off for the rest of your life. Yep. So my advice is based around that. When we're, advi when we're creating programs, <clears throat> we're like, for example, let's just say using a multitude of, of, of machines adds 2% more muscle than using free weights. Here's why I'm not going to put a million machines in my, in my programs. Most people don't have access to every single machine that I'm going to listen there. Most people have access to free weights. Also, if you're tall or short or you move differently or whatever, free weights follow you. Mach you have to follow the machine. So if you don't consider any of that, um, then you're not getting the full picture. So, yeah. And it's this just happens a lot in our space, but especially when there's complex things like diet and nutrition, um, and exercise and, you know, you know all this stress, like very complex pain, very complex. You're not going to get the answer by reading a few studies or listening to one person who specializes in the bodybuilding fanatical, ridiculous community. And, you know, there's a bit of a bias there going on too. So, well, uh, the problem with most, most all these studies too, is they're, they're done in such short windows. Yeah. 
so little so little can be actually measured in six to 12 weeks like you can get a, an idea of something but like to your original point if if we were to take if we actually followed a kid okay and same exact kid or the same two kids in the exact same situation same body types let's just pretend they're they're twins or yeah. whatever and uh you know and one decides to follow all the stuff that they hear is like these these exercises these uh isolation exercises are better for hypertrophy and then this person's going to do all these boring you know compound lifts yeah. that we talk about all the time and you follow that person over a year or two years time i am still going to put all my money on the person that's following the compound yes. lifts now they may get a slower start because of the learning curve yes. to your point it may take them it may take them two three months before they can even really load the bar. I mean, it took me a long time before I could really get after a squat. Right. I spent almost a year fixing my squat before I could start to load that yes. sucker and see the gains really start to compile. So if you were to have taken me for a six month study, I would have shown leg press and leg extension was better for my legs, but that's not the case years later of, of lifting. You take take two people who've never learned how to type properly, but who type all the time with the, you know, the hunt and peck method, and you have them compete on speed of typing, but you take one of them and say, we're going to teach you how to type properly. And you have to use yeah. proper typing techniques. For the first three months, he's going to get smoked by the guy using this method right here. But after, after he <laughs> really starts to master the technique of typing, he's going to surpass and hit much higher limits with the speed of typing, right? That's what we got to consider. So look, we're not interested in short-term yeah. results. Well, the we're ceiling is front. much higher. Yeah, it is. For, and and here's know, the deal. Compound lists. Short, the short term, uh, there is no problem with short term fitness. There isn't. People lose weight all the time. The problem is not losing weight. The problem is not getting in shape in 30 days. People do that all the time. It's keeping it, right? That's the challenge. Yeah. That's what we talk about. So when we program our programs, like if you don't, under, and here's a problem, and this is, I told that kid this, I said, you're unconsciously incompetent. I didn't mean to be, I wasn't trying to be rude, but I'm like, you don't know what you don't know. So you're, yeah. you're coming in with an opinion but you're also blindfolded. And so you're just parroting one thing that you've heard. And, yeah. And, you yeah. Know, there's to not, your point, to what Sal said, to, yeah. to a, a bias that you already want to hear. Right? Exactly. That's half the problem. I right would have loved to hear some of that stuff as a kid because it's, that's hard. Yeah. yeah. I was lucky by the way, I ran into power lifters who told me otherwise. And because I was a kid and they were jacked, I'm like, I'm going to do what they say. But had I not run into those power lifters, I would have read an article. I would have been like, oh, squats. They don't build. I mean, I could build as much muscle doing leg extension, leg curls, and, and leg press. I'm doing that. Well, this is somewhat, I mean, uh, again, I didn't read this with you guys. And so, uh, you know, I, I could totally see, you know, where you're coming from with this. This is somewhat similar to conversations I've had with these kids. We just did a lift-a-thon on Friday. And it's basically, it's the reveal of all the hard work oh, since yeah. January. And it's like... You know, some kids are getting a little bit uh, frustrated and this and that because they want to get the beach muscles. They want the hypertrophy <laughs> focus. They want all these other things. But I'm like, you got to trust the process. Trust the process. And guess what? You know, we get to to the day where we're now we're going to display uh, and go for our max lifts. And it blew their mind how much they could lift in comparison That's so awesome. to before. And it's yeah. like, you know, it's. All of that was foundationally driven strength and, and was addressing things that they didn't even know I was addressing, right? And it's like, I don't have to sit there and explain all this stuff. I have those years of experience and that foresight as to what I see in terms of imbalances, what I see in terms of lose, loss of power, leaks of power. Uh, and, you know, they don't... It, it, it's it's at that point where you just have to kind of concede sometimes and be like, I got to trust that this result is going to happen. Yeah, dude. When I did when I was a kid, I remember when I did judo, my dad brought me when I was 12. The first like, I don't know, like two months, you just learn how to fall properly. And I'm like, I just want to learn how to throw people. Yeah. I want to learn how to choke people. And you know, It's sensei's, not always sexy, man. No, you Sensei's know? like, you got to learn how to fall, dude. <laughs> yeah. If you don't learn how to fall, this ain't gonna, none of the other stuff's going to matter. So... Yeah, I know it's funny. I know it's funny we have to have these conversations, but it's good because it's it's it, again you don't know what you don't know, and so it's it could it could be easy to to judge or create an opinion without realizing the complexity. Yeah, but I, I you know I mean I, I didn't engage. I wanted to engage, and I like took a deep breath. And I'm like, I'm not going to engage this kid right now. Yeah. But the, the, I think the part that annoys me is that do you think that we haven't read all those studies? 
Yeah. yeah. Do, do you think the three? We're you know, unaware. Yeah. Do you think we're <laughs> unaware of that? You know, because of this because some other guys touting it on on Instagram or YouTube. You don't think we read those studies too, or what? Like, yeah. I pay attention to all those people. The, most of those most of the studies they're pulling from are years old, so it's not. You any, didn't see? No, did you see what I eventually said? No, I said because he listed some of the people he's heard this from, and okay. I'm like, oh, I'm not gonna say their names. So I don't want to call anybody out, but I'm like, all right. I said, here's do this. Uh, if you want to listen to anyone else other than us, here's two people that I think have great um, advice. They're very science-based, but they're also very experienced. They understand the whole picture. Joe DeFranco. Joe DeFranco, yeah. Brett Contreras. Yeah. yeah. The, okay, fitness stuff, right? You look at their fitness stuff, and they know they have a better idea of the complete picture because they look at the science. They... Contreras, I believe. I'd say Lane is up there too. Yeah. Lane Norton. They're yeah. heavy on application. Though. I'd say Lane Lane's yeah. up there too. Yeah, yeah. Lane's very heavy stuff. science based. Yeah, and yeah. yet, but when it comes to lifting, they understand a lot of Somewhat, those things. Yeah, but yeah. Brett and and Joe specifically have trained people over and over and over again. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so when you talk to them, you hear you know, you'll hear a lot of the stuff that we say. Um, that's not why I like them. It's just that they they have the experience. Uh, you know, not just the not just the studies. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. I got I got to tell you guys a hilarious story yeah. this weekend. So Jessica and I had. A weekend away. Oh, you went to Sanctuary, yeah? No, 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 no. We oh. went. We went somewhere else. We were at Half Moon Bay. Oh, oh Half Moon so, Bay. Yes. Was that like a change of plan or what? Yeah, yeah oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Gorgeous up there, by the way. It was uh, like it was sunny but cool. And um, where did you guys stay? Yeah, it was a nice weekend. Ritz. Oh, you did. That, yeah, oh, it's yeah. a beautiful one. Gorgeous. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's on the cliff. The fire. Right Have there. you been there? Yeah, yeah. The fire oh, pits on the cliff. Spectacular, right? So yeah. we go there, and it's a special, special thing because you know the baby's. This is like one of our first times away, and she's finally. I'm a, I don't want to like, don't I don't want to dare. Yeah, yeah. But she's uh her like extreme nausea, I think is over. She still gets some of it, but not like it was where she Crazy was like, Odin. like yeah. bedridden or whatever. Yeah. So I'm like, let's, you know, so we're like, let's have a nice weekend. So my mom watched the baby. So we go up there and we have this incredible dinner. It was like a, a seven course, like tasting menu. And, you know, so we're like really having a good time. I'm drinking, enjoying myself. Anyway, we go to bed and you guys know how I'm, I've been trying to get leaner uh, because I snore. At night, it keeps her up, and it's kind of you know, <laughs> like this is a, like a thing, you know, it's like a battle, and I, it, you, you don't want you don't want to have to sleep in a separate room from your wife, right? So, trying to fix it by losing weight, and I, I had I hadn't snored for like four days, so I'm like awesome. So we go to this, we go there, we have this dinner. I drink. You, I don't know if you guys know this, but oh, yeah. alcohol. Tell me snore. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, dude. yeah, yeah. So we go to bed, and uh, throughout the whole night, she'll like bump me or like wake me up, you know, <laughs> and I'm half awake. So, so, you know, she wakes me up a little bit and then I'm annoyed too. So we're kind of back and forth this all night. Right. So finally I'm like, Oh, you, you're making too much noise. You just keep making noise. I said to her and she's like, I'm doing that to prevent you from snoring. Cause then you snore and I can't sleep. And so then we get this little argument, go back to sleep. <laughs> I must've started snoring again because Jessica gets out of bed and she goes, do you mind if I take the covers? And I said, yeah, I usually don't sleep with covers. I'm like, go ahead. Where are you going? She's like, in the bathroom. So she takes- the She did not sleep in the bathtub. In the bathtub. No, she did. <laughs> she did, bro. She took- she You guys took, are at the Ritz and she's sleeping bro, in the bathtub. Yeah, they, <laughs> hey, hey, they have a big tub. Yeah, at, least, at least it's a nice bathtub. There. She, takes, she takes the covers. She takes everything, goes in there and closes the door. So now I'm sleeping in, you know, with no covers. She's in the bathtub and, you know, we're both kind of like annoyed, right? And, uh, and then- I started getting a little cold, you know? So I'm like, oh man. And then I started feeling bad for her. I'm like, she's sleeping in the bathtub. Like she's pregnant. Like this is messed up. So then I go in there. <laughs> I'll sleep in the bathtub. Winning. So I would never fit in the bath. So I go in there and I wake her up. I'm like, honey, I'm like, just come into bed. I'll, I'll try to sit up in bed so that I don't snore as much. So I convince her. She comes back. I'm sitting up in bed. Then, you know, we get a little argument again. And the boy is like, oh, dude. Uh, but she was so like, she was good. She handled me well. Because so she had every right to be annoyed, uh, you know, with the whole thing. And the fact that she went in the bathroom <clears throat> was really nice. Even though I took it as like, you took the covers. But, oh, uh, bro. <laughs> now, has she, so. has she tried to do like earplugs? Because I know some. I she know won't because she, it makes her anxious because she wants to hear if she hears the baby or whatever. Uh, yeah. So uh, that sucks. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. You, know. you can't really win in that situation. <laughs> no, but <laughs> do you know what I drank, dude? Doug and Doug and I were in Utah, right, this last week, and uh Brooke was showing us this house. And I had you had you ever seen a house that had that? A, a snore room? Oh no, I've never what? heard snore of that room. before. Yeah. So she actually was like she was showing it was a custom home, it was like this crazy, like five million dollar plus home she was showing us that one of her friends was building or whatever, and she was showing the layout, and then it's the master yeah. bedroom. And then you go through like I think the bathroom or, or closet, and then and then there's a, a a room that's like sealed, and it's called a, they call it a snore room. 
And for that exact That's reason, where you get punished. Or whatever. No, I think that well, no, for the exact reason, like husband snore like that, you send his ass to the snore room, and that's where he's. he's uh, I never heard of that before. I don't know I, about you guys, but I do not hilarious. like sleeping in, uh, separate from my wife. I don't. It feels weird to me. It doesn't feel like yeah. we're married, you know. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm not going to sleep in a different room. I'm just going to get leaner. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to lose some weight too because I can't be. I can't be keeping you up all night. Well, you know? I end, I end up right now a lot in the other room. Uh, actually, last night I guess they Katrina left and must have slept with Max in, in her room. But when he comes, like he's been sick so much, so we let him in the bed yeah. when he's sick, and then he's like kicking me, coughing on me. That's how I got sick again because he was coughing on me all night long. So a lot of times I'll, I'll start in bed with her. Yeah. And then around one or two, he wakes up or something. He'll come in, and then I just like half asleep walk to the other room, yeah. and then I end up sleeping like that. So it's been oh, kind man. of our life for like the last year or so. Dude, it's so, so funny though. I go yeah. in the bathroom, and she's like curled up. Like, dude, I can't believe she's in the tub, dude. dude. Well, and I felt like the big. Hey, I felt like the big because I got I was a little annoyed because you know when you're half well, asleep, the irony, you're not really the irony of being at like the Ritz too. You know what I'm saying? You're at like the super fancy hotel and she's sleeping in the bathtub. That's dude, gonna be it was so stupid. Yeah, check that off is not <laughs> one of her favorite places <laughs> now. So, but hey, the, the the food was incredible. Oh uh, my bet. god, they do that like because I like I like uh, I'm not you guys know this. I'm not a big things person. I don't spend money on things, but I'll spend on experiences. And so they bring out like these little, and you know what's funny is if I ever, if I took my like my grandfather or my dad to a restaurant like that, they would hate it because it's such small yeah. portions, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I love that. I love tasting a little bit and then waiting and you know taking two or three hours for for dinner was it's a lot. Very of fun. Italian of you. It, well, you know, <laughs> no, I'll tell you, you no, know, that's how they are over there though. Like over over over. No, your, you get a lot of everything. No, no, no. no. I mean, like a, the the taking time between meals. Oh like, yeah. Like a meal is like a four hour experience. Oh, yeah, I'll never yeah, forget yeah. going over there. How like weird that was for me, bro. Like, you'll see your waiters in between. Yeah, they just like take off. Yeah, they'll take. I'll go yeah. smoke outside. Yeah, yeah. You're no, like, bro, what are you doing? Go get yeah, my food. <laughs> yeah, no. And they and like between each like uh, serving is like a half hour. It's like dude, we're gonna be here all day. My grandfather one time went to a restaurant restaurant like that and he's old school right and they brought out uh one of the one of the dishes was three just three ravioli mm. you should have seen my grandfather's face i thought he was gonna like kill someone it's like what the hell he gets up and he goes to the back and starts complaining where's the rest of my food <laughs> yeah, yeah. who gives why you only give me three ravioli i'm like no no that's not how it works that's just a tasting menu. That's, yeah that was always my perception of these high-end uh restaurants is they just give you these tiny little portions i was like i don't get it I don't understand it. And uh, then you, once you get older, you understand the palate. You're like, wow, yeah, <laughs> this is so fantastic. Would you, did you do anything with the, your family this weekend? Yeah. Well, we, we spent some time uh, going to the beach and, you know, getting a lot of sun and stuff. Was and, there a lot of people out there? Cause the weather was so Yeah, good. there was, I mean, it was, it was pretty packed. Uh, I did have a pretty cool experience because, uh, so I, you guys remember when I was talking about my uh, trip, when I went to, Salt Lake and, and the kids were competing in the, in gymnastics. Yeah. And then I wasn't able to get these, uh, medals because oh, yeah. like, it, you know, like it was like way later and I felt like terrible. <laughs> and I was like, you know, like just talking about it. And I guess, uh, so this guy, Craig Ornes, he, um, runs his own, um, trophy business and does like, um, rings and class rings and, you know, all this kind of stuff out of Iowa. He was like, Hey man, I just wanted to, uh, you know, make these for you and send them to you what? for your kid. A listener. Um, yeah. A listener. Oh, that's so cool. I what? was like, just totally taken back, man. That was so cool. I want a trophy. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> just a random trophy. And he was going to do them for the lift a thon thing. I was throwing together too, but unfortunately it didn't kind of come in time, but like, the the medals for the gymnastics came and so I had them and I was like oh I got to do something like cool to set this up uh, for Everett and so he actually had his friend with us uh, one of his good friends we took him to the beach with us and uh, so I was like oh Everett stay there he was up on the rocks and I'm like I got something for you and then like did this whole like ceremony had oh, Courtney, shut like up. put it was on he all him. pumped and he's like yeah and, like I had him like oh, I took some cool. pics of him you know, out there oh, that's uh, great. with that. But it was just really cool because he... It's cool know, he received it well, too. Because yeah. he could have still been like a little shit about it. Yeah. Like, this isn't the real trophy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what but he knows he won. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. still, I mean, it's Had cool his that, name on the back and everything oh, for the events. And so, dude, he was so, so pumped yeah. about it. I just like, I, I seriously, I can't like say enough about our fans. That's dude. great. They come through. Dude, I'm so, you just reminded me something. It's so shameless for me to do this, but you just, because you said that about our listeners and I know we have a bunch of listeners that actually have 3d printers. 
So uh, my truck's here today, and I don't know if you guys you noticed my my center of my hubcaps are out on all my on my truck. No, have you know never noticed that before? Uh -huh. Okay, so I lost the center hubcap that covers the the lug nuts on one of the the four tires, and it just looks stupid with one yeah. missing. So I've pulled them all off, and I've been trying to. You can't. They discontinued it. Oh, can't man. order anywhere. Can't find anything. And it dawned on me the other day. Actually, Katrina brought it up. She said, Did, "Don't you guys have a bunch of people that do three D printing?" And I'm like, "Oh my god, it's such a. It's just a piece of plastic." So what do you send them one and he copies it? <clears> yeah, it should be able to do it. So uh, if you are a listener and you have a three D printer, of course I'll pay you. It's not a big deal. Like I because I can't order it. I can't buy one. I've been, been been meaning to bring it up on the show. I actually meant to bring it so I could show it. But I mean, it's literally like this this big around, and I can send that out first. So. You know, DM me or message me, get a hold of me or whatever. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Did you when you guys were kids? What did you like better, a medal or a trophy? Did you guys trophy. have a preference? Trophy for sure. Yeah, you were trophy. trophy. I wasn't yeah. the medal guy either. Yeah. You know yeah. what I hated the most? Mm. A ribbon. Do you ever win a ribbon? <laughs> yes. What is that? <laughs> I threw all those away. Oh, a, rib a ribbon <laughs> so uh, science fair or four H. <laughs> uh, that's why. Yeah, yeah science fair or four I mean, H. Blue that's ribbon. It's like yeah, it's not very sports. Nah. It's not very or, or it's also like, oh, here's your ribbon for participating. What the hell is that? Dude? Yeah. I don't need a participation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ribbon or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. dumb. Yeah, yeah. I, I trophies like, first. Yeah, you wanted a guy that was like buff, swinging a bat, or like shooting a basketball. I love that when you get a trophy. I mean, I don't care what sport you played. Whoever the person displayed in yeah. the trophy they were always jacked yeah. yeah and you wanted the tallest one right there's the yeah, smaller yeah, the ones you tall, want the tall one that's just like dude i got i got obvious. a i got a trophy i mean it's not as big as some of the i've seen some crazy trophies but it had like two like layers to it you know? <laughs> so it's like pillars <laughs> another <laughs> layer pillars whatever. on the side i was like everything. oh this is the best trophy ever. i think yeah. this is one of the biggest ones i've had i don't think i have i don't think i ever got any all the soccer and uh basketball oh, ones hey, we got bronze were all, guy well, yeah, yeah the the usa one and that's bigger than the uh regular show so if you do like a regular show the the guy's i don't know about that big or whatever with that so the usa is, is mm. a is a bigger piece. are they still giving they're still giving kids <laughs> participation trophies huh a lot of places I mean, they, uh, yeah, but uh, I don't. My, it, my kids, it is a thing to like. Sh kids throw them away. Yeah, they don't care. They don't. Did you know what else? Unless is they earn it, it's like so stupid. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. I um, who was it? It was my. Uh, I want to say it might have been my daughter. She was playing basketball when she was younger, and they didn't keep score, so mm -hmm. they don't keep score of the game. Kids just play. Ridiculous. You know who keeps the score? Kids. The kids keep yeah. the score. They yeah. know who won. They every time. Yeah. What are we doing? Why are we not keeping score? After the game, you know, my daughter comes up to we won, you know, twenty five to whatever. It's just I'm like, more you guys ideas. Keep they think it's a nice idea to be inclusive and whatever, but it takes out the whole like meaning of the sport and the merit of your efforts. So like what you're doing is really just cannibalizing the sport. It's also counter uh, human behavior. And you know what you don't teach kids? When you do that, you never teach them how because yeah. working together, you need to learn how to fail too and win, and that you suck. Sometimes. You know, we, there's we, a skill in winning. You know what? And we we, we talk about this a lot about this with kids, but you know this this bled into business and adults. Yep. I mean, I remember when I was at 24, the 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 thing that got me to finally leave that company. Was, so I went through eight different comp plans in less than 10 years, right? So basically every year, God. a new comp plan. Yeah, and crazy. every time the comp plan would come out, every, anybody that's ever been through that in a company, it's always geared to help the company. Yes. That's why they they, re, they restructure it. But for the first six of those, they still always dangled the carrot enough. Like, so if you were part, like, so it was like this, the original comp plan, if you were in the top 20 percentile, mm -hmm. you crushed. And then the next comp plan comes out. It's like, well, as long as you're in the top 15%, yeah, you can yeah, yeah. still crush. <laughs> the 10. Then the 10. Like, it kept doing that, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, and I always found a way to stay in the top and, and make really good money. Well, the final comp plan before I left, it put a ceiling. It didn't matter. It didn't matter if I was the 1%. If I was yeah. the best in the entire company, I had a, I was not going to continue to get paid. So why more. do that extra bit to push? So, exactly. But the idea and the concept was to try and bring up the D and C players uh, up by incentivizing them by paying them more mm. for you know basically and doing the same job. Work? How good did that no. strategy work? Yeah, it did <laughs> not work. <laughs> that was a yeah, terrible a, strategy. <laughs> I know it didn't work it at all. It always sounds logical, like yeah, people yeah. trying to explain it. Well, but you know it why it doesn't play out like that? Well, here's the deal: it's because they're the they're the loud majority, mm. right? They're the eighty percent. So they're the eighty percent. They're constantly you think of a company that has yeah. you know ten thousand employees. And you've got six thousand of them. Bar oh, we're not our yeah, salaries are not paid enough. Yeah. So what do they do? They, they they took the cream off the top to help feed all the bottom and bring everybody up a little bit. But then it ends up. But that's the wrong way to do it. I know it is. It, initially, it makes the majority happy. 
because they got paid a little bit more. But what you ended up doing was you discouraged all your and horses. And you also get rid of your, your, your top performers. Yeah, your horses. And you get rid of your, your, your rabbits. Yeah, your Nobody's horses. Nobody's chasing them. Yeah, you're, 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 the, the people that were pulling that company up, yep. you, they all go find other places to go make money. Yeah, so. no, no. In, in tech, uh, I forgot who said this, and this is actually a true statistic. A super high-performing engineer, like one, is worth, I think, more in mm -hmm. terms of production than like 20... It was like a ridiculous number, like 20 or 30 yeah. of your standard. You've engineers. shared that stat before, and I would make the case that that's the same in almost every profession. You, you, most, you're probably right. Right? I mean, yeah. think about think about your experience, okay? And, and I mean, I always had somewhere between, on the low end, probably 12 to 15 trainers, and the high end, 25 trainers working for me. And, you know, it was three or four that, like, I could literally turn over the, the rest. Yeah, right. And hire a brand new person. Keep those top three or Keep four. those top three. And we would be trucking along just fine yeah, because yeah. they were the bulk of the revenue yeah. stream and they were the real talent. Yeah. And not only that, because there's there's other, there's another way that makes them more valuable aside from their personal production themselves, but they also have the skill sets to train yep. the, the new players that are coming in. So I would imagine that right. that engineer stat that you bring well, up look, all the time is similar. Uh, look, I don't know about you guys, but if every great uh, production team I've ever been on always had a superstar and that's part of the reason why other people <coughs> rose to the occasion. Yeah. You know, I actually had a, um, it's speaking motivating. of winning and losing, I had a, a good teaching opportunity for my daughter recently. So my daughter, my oldest daughter, she's 12. She's hyper ambitious, like very, very ambitious, very hardworking. So awesome. Um, it is, but what's the dark side of that, right? Is that you can you can overwork yourself, stress of course, yourself, that stuff. Right but away. I know I know you too, though. You would always yeah. rather have a kid or an employee that you would have to pull back, of course. Than you constantly. It's have. just different, right? Yeah, different right. Oh coaching, yeah, definitely. Different. And so she she ran for student council, and the position she ran for, she's in sixth grade. She was running against the seventh grader, so the odds that she was going to win are very low because it's hard. You know, you know how it is when you're a kid, like a grade above you, they're going to get more attention, more votes, that kind of stuff. But she was super prepared, did her speech, got her posters, like, and really impressive. Like, I, I don't think I would have given a speech in front of the school at sixth grade, but she went up and did it and did the yeah, whole I thing. Around for I don't think I would have done it. Scared well, anyway, was. she didn't win. So she, which the odds of her winning were super low to begin with. <coughs> she was so upset. Right? Oh, really? I, yeah. Because oh, that's man. my daughter. She's so, and I, you know, I had a nice conversation with her and I said, you know, cause I always call her champion. And I said, you know why I call you a champion? I said, it's not cause you win all the time. It's because you don't give up. And I said, eh, you know, you either win or you, or you learn. And we had this whole conversation about it. And I also mm -hmm. told her, look, you did your best. The odds were low, but now you can pick up from this, learn, and then try again next time. But this is what life is all about. You're going to, and every time you lose, you have the opportunity to become much better. I said, and I told her this too. I said, you learn way more from losing than you do from winning, which is true. Although there's lessons in winning, you learn way more. I mean, every loss I ever had, I way more learning came from and growth came from that. Oh, yeah. We had this whole conversation. But I time. felt so bad. She was so upset because she put it's she, tough, she, yeah. When she you're worked a kid, so hard. Yeah, yeah. You just want nothing but. But she's, dude, she's a. She's an animal. Yeah. Now, uh, comparing the two, your two kids, your two oldest, uh, it, do they both handle loss and frustration completely different? Um, like how, how does Domenico handle it when like, I mean, he, he doesn't like it either, but he's, uh, less of a perfectionist in that sense. So I think he kind of, and he's also older. So he's kind of handled some of this as he's, cause he's, you know, he's going to turn, geez, he'll be 17 this year. Um, you know, he's, he's learned some of that stuff as, as they go along also ambitious, uh, uh, you know, individual, but He's just older, and I think he kind of gets it a little bit. He also gets frustrated, especially if he really puts. That's what I mean. In. Like, I mean, I don't know if you can still remember, like, remembering when he was her age, like his first like yeah. failure or struggle. Like, did he handle it like her, or did he handle it in a different manner? Do you he, remember? He, I'm trying to think right now. He would get upset. He would definitely get upset. You know, she's she's funny though because so he measures things differently. So they both have an element in me. Like my daughter has the this hyper ambition, and my son can also be very meticulous about an understanding about practicality. So he'll do something like, well, if I, do, if I score more than 75% on this test, it's not going to affect my grade. I can't go up another grade. <laughs> so he's, he'll, he'll do it like that, right? He'll do the math. He'll do the That's math, great. right? Whereas my daughter's like, the report's due Friday. I have to turn it in on Monday. Like, why? Why do you have to turn it on Monday? Because I have to. Like, what? <laughs> you, know, you have to turn it on Monday. It's due Friday, you know? So that sense, they're, they're very different. But I was, I was grateful for the for the teaching opportunity. I just felt bad because I know that she 
you know, she she really put a lot into it type of deal. Uh, but man, sixth grade, going up speak in front of people, it's huge. I yeah. know, dude. Yeah. That's that's uh, pretty, I wouldn't have pretty, done that. No, I don't. no, not in sixth grade. No, 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 it took me a while to pick that. up. I remember, I remember sixth grade was about when you start doing the speeches in front of the class, and I actually never liked that. stuff. That's your most self conscious yeah. too at that age. I didn't like it until uh, junior college. I had a good experience in junior college. I had a good, a good decent one of my better teachers uh, in junior college for speech. And that was the first time I actually didn't mind getting up, but I still don't. I mean, I passed on one of the last oh. things that we did. I still, uh, don't love doing that. You yeah. know? Dude, it was fourth grade for me. It was very vivid and, and like, like traumatized. Bro. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I was literally traumatized. I can see it on your face when you said it right there. He's I, like, yeah. I remember exactly oh. what date it was. 1989. Yeah, I was no, wearing I, yeah. the blue shorts with yeah. the red. <laughs> yeah. I had my bangs up like this. Did you my say oh my house. God, bro. Tell bro. the story. I want to yeah, hear it now. Dude, I was like, uh, so this, this literally did like traumatize me. It, I bombed so bad. How have you never told this story? He us. did once. He did? Yeah, yeah he froze. Did a long time ago. Because, yeah, I froze. I um, I was trying to describe something that was not in my wheelhouse. So this was, like, <laughs> how to cook something. And my mom, like, just helped me come up with an idea. Because I couldn't think about, like, being able to teach the class how to do something, which was the assignment. So I had to get in front of the class and then, like, describe. Oh, okay something, you know, I could have just stuck with sports, which would have been a way better idea. So I get it. So you had to tell a descriptive speech. Yes. And you, you, and your mom gave you the idea, let's do a recipe. Let's do a recipe and then have that so they can eat it and they're going to be all happy. You know, like such a mom idea. Okay. Yeah. Like I'm going to throw this right on her and <laughs> yeah. throw her under the bus. <laughs> let me high should, and dry. Everything makes sense right now. Anyway, continue. Dude, and then, yeah. so I'm, and so she's in there too, which was even worse. Um, and I'm like speaking in front of the class and I'm like trying to remember all the details. I'm like, oh, I don't remember. And then I'd be looking over for help. And she's just like, like trying yeah. to like mime it to me. <laughs> I'm like, this isn't working. And then I just like literally was like, oh. I was like, I don't know. And then I just like walked out of the class. Oh, oh shit. No. Like that. I lost my shit, dude. Yeah. Wow. wow. And so, and, and everybody was just like, you didn't know what to do, you know? Cause I obviously like, I just, I freaked out. Like, That's fourth grade. Fourth grade, and and wow. it, it, that's a hey, at that age, bro, of course, yeah. Me. Everybody judging me, you know, and all that. It, that stuck with me, dude, all the way up to college. And, and that's probably. how that's why you became a bully. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, that was part of it. I guess, uh, hey, that's why he definitely don't like doing this. Thing, no, right? that's why I don't do the speech thing, dude. I'm not like interested. It and it really is like something I've had to work my way out of it. But yeah, like yeah. even starting a podcast, like I remember. all that stuff, like. It's like just what I say means something. Well, so this is wow, a it's so. Wild. So I've had this conversation at least a hundred times with my kids, and I tell them this. I said, I don't care what what space you work in. I don't care what profession you have. Practice speaking in front of groups because it's the number one fear that people have. Whenever people yeah. list their top fears, one of the top fears is almost always speaking in front of large groups. So if you can develop, you don't even have to be great. If you're just not afraid of it or or you're better than most people, you'll be valuable in whatever well, you do. And this, it's true. This is the cool part though, is like so we talk about the differences in my kids and like how like Everett's probably like more my personality, but fearless. Fearless for t I was I sat in on one of his um presentations like he was doing for this author of a book that he was reading. Okay, he, I bet like, you were more, more nervous than he I'm was. I'm like just dying. You know, like, <laughs> I hope just, this I can just picture him. you, bro, like fucking <laughs> living vicariously through a fucking I'm stomach like, turning. Oh and God, shit. dude, this, like, this is all happening again. Can you not see him being yeah. like that with oh, his kid yeah. on the first time he had to speak like that? I could oh. just see. He crushed it. Oh, yeah, that's like great. A plus. That's awesome. You crushed it. I like I was holding him back. Oh, like, cool. I just like was I was like, oh my god. I need help because Thank god, I don't know, know how to not cry when I see my kids do some shit. I'm always like well, in the classroom if, and I'm always well, like, mm -hmm. especially something yeah. like that where they overcome something that you know has been a battle for Huge, you, right? It's yeah. your kid, you know it's your DNA right there. Something you battle with your whole life and then they overcome I'm like, it. That'd damn be like, it, he's gonna be so much better than me, dude. <laughs> like cause like, dude, he's hilarious. He's come out with jokes all the time. The other day, like, so Courtney like puts him to sleep and she's and she was like, I love you to the moon and back. You know, it's that kind of thing. He's like, I love you to Uranus and back, mom. You know? <laughs> and I'm just like, <laughs> that's amazing, dude. Like, I love it. Yeah. Like, he just comes up with like, crazy stuff all the time. Uh, uh, speaking anyway. of things that are terrifying, I know we weren't supposed to bring this up, but uh, I'm, I'm going I'm to try and do this in a, in a, in a PC way. Uh, so I walk into the bathroom today. Oh, God, you're bringing that up. <laughs> 
What the Doug's like? Listen, I got to bring this up, Doug, because it's so crazy. I did take a picture. Well, I, I saw it first, bro. I we'll post the picture. You have to blur it out yeah, though. Andrew, I got the video. Yeah. No, I got the video. I walk in the bathroom, and on the toilet in the back is a massive sex toy. And yeah. it's a, it's a it's a realistic looking one. That's all I'm gonna say. It's yeah. a phallus, and it's, it's just sitting one. there. Yeah. In the yeah. back, I swear to God, Andrew, in the back of the toilet, like it's just stuck on the back. Like, stuck on the back. So I see massive. It. I come in first this morning. Okay, so I come in first, dude. I will. I'm the first one. I to thought go. one of you guys put it. So there, I went. Joke. I went back in there, <laughs> and I and I saw it, and I went, "Fucking Sal." Why did yeah, 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 you? Yeah, I would, because I would have okay. thought the same thing. Yes, too. Like, I said, "Fucking hey, screw his you guys." Prank, his pranks are yes, very much. I said, "Fucking Sal." Is exactly what I said. I went bought a big ass dog. And here's the thing: I was like, "I'm not. I'm not. You know, I'm not even going to give him. I'm not even give him the gratification. I'm not going to say nothing. I'm not going to say nothing. I'm going to act like it was no big deal. Like I'm not going to say shit because I know that's what he's trying to get out of me. So I didn't say anything to anybody. I just waited. I was like waiting for someone else to go back there and say something to see who really left it there because Doug and I were gone all week, so I knew obviously it wasn't Doug or I who did that. And that neither one of us would probably do a prank like that. So I knew it was one of you two, and I thought it was you. Yeah. But you said you didn't. No, do it. dude. I went back there. I'm like, what the hell? So here's what's even worse now. Now that it's none of you guys. Yeah. Who now, the hell? It's creepy. Like it's not like funny. It's like well, no one asked what? Andrew. Is that yours? Huh? Okay. Was it me? Okay. Was it me? Uh, that's, yeah. a, that's a <laughs> famous <laughs> Eddie Murphy line. Hey, right what there. if Andrew? Was it me? Was it what me? if Andrew's like? Me? Andrew's like, oh wait, was it? Was it red with? Like, yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, okay, it's not me. I'm like, was it you? He's like, oh, I, no. Now, now, not. now, I'm gonna tell you guys something right now. What a different. The way that I reacted is so different now than I would have reacted in my 20s. I swear to God, if I was in my 20s and I found that. Yeah. I would have been throwing it at you guys. I would have got it. I would have grabbed it with some toilet paper, and it would have. I would have been chucking at one of you guys. I mean, war. I mean, I would have still done that in my forty right now. The only difference is we have a staff now, so that goes. To my head. So <laughs> yeah. it's like Bro, we got like five, you throw some five employees. But dude, it's like it's cool. It's a joke, but like I need some resolve. Yeah, like, I can't go on my day not knowing like who put that's that what I'm in saying. There, I feel uneasy. Yeah, Doug, you're gonna have to make some calls. Yeah, we're gonna have to get to the bottom <laughs> of this. Doug, Doug, Google. Doug, Doug, <laughs> Doug starts calling. Hey. I have no idea where to need you to call all the people that that work around here and ask them yeah. if it's there. Show them a yeah. picture of it. It's yeah. yours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. we gotta do some sleuthing. Shake it in front. Go of get it face. out of the garbage. Look up the brand. We're gonna oh, find out where God. it was purchased. We're gonna isolate. Hey, how's uh, how's so okay? Weird. So D Doug was with me. By the way, it was so funny. We were having breakfast on the way out, and he's like on his he's off caffeine completely, and somebody <laughs> snuck it into his drink, and he was like freaking out. <laughs> I've been off caffeine. No caffeine. Did, did you like? So it? he's been off. He's yeah, off. Oh, good. Nice He's guys. off completely. I'm down to one cup of coffee. I know you're not even trying. Where are you strong, at? Where dude. are you at right now? I'm down now. So I'm I'm doing the staggered, you know, kind of approach. Um, and what I've been doing now is I did what you told, what you said. I mixed Organifi red juice with pure. Yeah. Oh, how is oh, that? Oh, you tried that? Dude, I tried that. It's, it's great. Amazing. It's yeah. great. It's like um you definitely get energy energy from it. You feel good, but it's non stimulatory. It's not like caffeine, right? Yeah. So it's a good how does it taste together? Not bad. Not bad. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not bad at all. It's not bad. Damn, yeah. I just had I just had mine, but Should I did some pure in there. I, well, I'm do. I wonder if because I, I do mine with element tea right now. So I do the watermelon element tea with the you red. You can throw them all three together. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. It's not, it's not a big, there's no. There's no interaction. <laughs> no whole salad. Dude. Just dump it all. <laughs> he pours it in yeah. like smoke comes up. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, pure and red juice because they're both you know kind of nootropic, adaptogen, whatever. Okay. Great combination. So yeah, I've lowered my caffeine to now where I'm alternating. You know, high days are 200 milligrams, low days are 100 milligrams, and I'm going to give it another week before I go off uh, completely. I don't, I mean, the, even even the way I'm doing it, I'm still noticing some of the effects, but the the red juice and now combining with the pure has helped. Yeah, I was the, taking it with uh, before the whole lift a thon thing. I, it was funny because I realized too, like, because we had parents, we had people in the community come and everything, and like, I was like, I'm like, man, am I going to be nervous? But I decided to like, get a microphone in a in a speaker and then that changed everything for me for some reason i'm that's like my comfort zone really i'm like yeah you know cause Cause like, just, <laughs> yeah dude because now i can like mc and and have personality behind it otherwise i'm just like yelling trying to get attention and it's just like you know, the floor is mine dude like everybody has to suffer with what you know I'm what's saying. weird about uh, about you. Well, there's a lot of things weird about you, but this part's really, this part's really, <laughs> there is a lot of things. Ju I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, so Justin, obviously you got to think about speaking in to groups in public. Yeah. 
but tell him to be funny or give him an instrument or something like that, and he'll do that shit in front of hella people. Yeah, and I think that's way hard. I yeah. would never do that. Way harder. Yeah, I would never. Way do that. harder. I much prefer that. Yeah, act all, is, act yeah. all goofy and silly and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, I would. I, I have no, a hard time with that. Way more cha- challenging. No yeah. way. We're, hey, I have some different. I have some things I want to uh, talk about or add to uh, cold therapy. So you know, we had Wim Hof on. Yep. Which uh, that episode will be airing. Uh, one of my favorites. Soon. Dude, such a great one. Um. And, and <laughs> yesterday, Doug says oh, yesterday. Yeah. It was already up. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So as, as of the recording of this, we've already had it up. But anyway. You guys um, saw it. So. so people in our space always, again, this is actually to, to the beginning of the episode. They talk about everything in relation to muscle growth. And they don't consider <laughs> the big picture. So cold therapy, if you do it post-workout, does blunt, not destroy, but a little bit will blunt the muscle building signal. Because the muscle building signal is mediated through many different ways, but one of them is inflammation. So you work out, this is an inflammatory response that tells the body repair, build muscle. If you reduce some of the inflammation by immersing yourself in cold water, then you'll build a little bit less muscle, a little bit less strength. So you got all these fitness people like, don't use cold therapy post-workout. There's a way to use cold therapy post-workout where you'll actually, you'll benefit from. And here's how it is. Because it blunts the inflammatory response, it allows you to train with more volume. Mm. So you can actually tip over slightly the doing too much scale, add the cold therapy, and then you're okay. Oh, that's interesting. Now, why would you want to do that? Because more volume allows you to practice exercise skills more often. So Mm. I could see this being valuable to like Olympic lifters or power lifters where Mm. perfecting the skill of a lift is so important. I I I could also make this argument too. Um, Yeah. uh, I don't need to make the case that uh, sleep is extremely important, Mm -hmm. right? A lot of people would say it's one of the the most important things when it comes to recovery and building muscle and stuff. Uh, One of the best things about cold therapy is it trains you to breathe correctly. And Mm. most of us do not breathe correctly. Yeah. And just the practice, I remember when I first started to learn how to box breathe, and uh, at night, if I was th- th- anxious and thinking about work, oh, and yeah, that, good point. how quickly I could box breathe and bring, my, I mean, I, I've shared this on the podcast a long time ago. Katrina would actually like elbow me and then she would make me breathe with her. Come on. And we would do our, we'd do the mm. breaths together. And then after like five of those, I'd be like, Ooh, oh, come down okay. and then go to sleep. So this is, so, and the, and just like anything else. Uh, you you train it all the time and then you get faster and better at doing it or subconsciously just learn how to do that. Yeah. So yes, it may blunt the the muscle building signal or dampen the-, the Yeah, but you're the, not looking at the whole picture. Right, but it, but if it increases your sleep, sleep quality by 15 to 20% over the that period- That more than makes up the difference. That more than makes up for it. So there are other, and, here, and it, this ties in perfect with the way we started this podcast that I can't stand when we take a study- and then there would be people that will shit on cold therapy for yeah. people that are trying to build muscle for that reason. When there's a much bigger picture going yep. on besides just the fucking one hour workout and then the 30 minutes afterwards. 100%. So you have, to, and let, let's talk about stress, what that does when you when you learn how to adapt inside cold therapy. So there's so many other benefits that also contribute to building muscle and recovery that you are getting from that. So if you are a hardcore muscle building person and you've heard you shouldn't do cold therapy yeah, for the reasons that- Because it reduces the muscle building signal by 7%. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. you got to factor in all those other things. 100%. And, and, and to my point, like if you're if you're practicing a skill, like a, like a clean or a jerk, which are very, very skill-based, more volume is more important so you can practice it more often. Well, if you're already on the line of overtraining, like I can't practice it anymore. Yeah. Well, if you're going to do cold therapy afterwards, you can throw in a few more sets and you'll balance it out. No, that was my- that was my whole point with that. Yeah. Anyway, I want to ask you guys, uh, do your guys' wives steal your caldera like mine does? <laughs> yeah, all the time. So yeah. I need to get, so it's so funny because it's, I mean, everybody uses it, but I know initially caldera was kind of like advertising it to men, although it's it's for both men and women. My my, I let her try it, which was my mistake. It's now it's hers. It's not mine. Mm-hmm. Oh, see, Katrina hasn't tried it yet. Oh, yeah. don't. Yeah, 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 don't give it to her. No, she'll take it. No, I'm I'm stingy with my stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. I got my little kit that I keep, and it's like on my side of the sink. You stay on your side, my yeah. side. Yeah, we're very. No, no, Jessica, it's, it's it. It's not mine anymore, dude. Now is she using <laughs> uh, the cream, the oil? Which one is she? Just use? the serum. The serum. Just mm-hmm. the. Ser- I mean, that's the main. I mean, all the other stuff is valuable too, but that serum is. I, I, so I actually, big difference. so, okay. Yeah. So the serum is what got me started using it. And I use that every, you just saw me putting it on before we started the podcast. Uh, but I actually like the moisturizer the best. Really? Yeah. I, I do you use the moisturizer, Doug? I do. I, that's personally it's my really, favorite. It's really, really nice. Yeah. I mean, I could like literally put it on and 
see a dramatic difference. And the and the serum gives me kind of this a little shiny look, like yeah. a little like almost oily looking, which is whatever. I mean, it's fine because I have dry skin, so yeah. I like it and it feels amazing. But the moisturizer, I feel like it doesn't do that, and it just it, I don't know how to explain it. The serum lasts forever too, because I put it on my face, and I have oily skin, so it doesn't make me oily. It actually balances it out, yeah. so it works. Well. But it's like two drops. That that thing that's will what, last yeah, me. That's what's cool about forever. This. Yeah, the serum will go a long ways. I yeah. go through the moisturizer pretty fast. I put it on my hands a bunch, which helps. I, dude, they get so dry and crack like all the time, and I just put that. Do you on drink enough this. water? <laughs> yeah, dude, I drink a lot of water. I don't know. Are you sure? Yeah, bro, I drink water all the time. A, it's like a, a big thing. You're just yeah. a gator. I'm just a gator, dude. <laughs> <laughs> like, dryness, like like, just follows yeah. me. Well, anyway, I hope, I hope, I hope at the, I mean, just to finish this off here, I hope we find the culprit for the, uh, the, the toy in the, in the bathroom. We yeah. need to find out this, because I, I'm seriously freaking out yeah. about this. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the show. Real quick, we work with a company called Live On Labs. They make supplements, vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that use a delivery method called liposomal technology. This means it actually gets absorbed and utilize. One of my favorite products is their liposomal glutathione. It's actually one of the only forms of glutathione shown to actually reach the bloodstream and raise glutathione levels. Master antioxidant, keeps your liver healthy, helps with recovery, much more. But they have more products than just that. They have a B-complex. They have an L-carnitine product. Uh, they have uh, quite a few things. Great stuff. And right now, you can get lipoglutathione free when you bundle it with the B-complex plus vitamin C and you can actually save $75 when you do this special bundle. So here's what you got to do. Go to mindpumppartners.com and click on Live On Labs for that hookup. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Andy Akins. Do you recommend deadlifts despite the internet saying it is not a great hypertrophy oh, movement? Oh, yeah. You know what else the internet says? <laughs> yeah. that, that, that the world is flat. Yeah. There's a whole group of people that say the world is flat. Lizard people rule everything. That lizard people rule. The so th it, this is silly. Um, the deadlift is a exceptional exercise, and it does build a lot of muscle. Okay, you ask anybody who's, been, who's very experienced with the deadlift, who's been training people for a long time, it has tremendous benefits. Now, I know there's studies that will say a barbell row is better for this or a pull-up is better for that. But overall, um, and this is one of the things that we have to consider when we look at exercises, what's their carryover to other exercises and what does that mean? This is a You have to look at the big picture. And there's few exercises that allow you to handle the load that a deadlift will allow you to handle. In fact, for most people, it's the heaviest exercise they'll ever do. Yes. And the amount of tension that that creates in the posterior chain, which includes the entire back, is unmatched. You're not going to get it with a barbell row. You're not going to get it with a pull-up. What place does that kind of demand on your body? Nothing. Nothing yeah. else Nothing. even compares. Nothing works no. supposed to your chain as, as, as well as a, as a deadlift does. But here's where this argument comes from. Okay, if you were to talk about hypertrophy of a specific muscle, like, say, the rear delts, because even the rear delts are getting some work yeah. in, in a deadlift, right? Because a deadlift literally hits the entire posterior chain. But could I pick an exercise uh, like more targeted. that could target the rear delts more for hypertrophy than a uh, deadlift? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, that's 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 fair. But for an overall back, hamstring, and glute exercise, you know, three of your biggest muscles on your body, nothing is going to build more muscle. No, you'd exercise. have to pick. It's, you'd have to put like six or seven exercises together, yeah. Yeah. and then that would be a lot of volume. It'd be a lot of work. It's not. You're not going to create as much tension uh, in the body. And, you know, here's the deal. I know a lot of people want, show me the guy or girl that deadlifts that's got a great back. Okay. Some of the most winningest Mr. Olympians. Ronnie Coleman, who is considered by most bodybuilding fans to be the greatest of all time. Okay. Like, you in know, a, in, a, in a league of his own when it comes to bodybuilding. He was a huge uh, deadlifter. Huge. Even Dorian Yates with the massive back, he stopped deadlifting later on in his career, but he did deadlifts uh, when he was younger in his career. Most bodybuilders do. You have now the Mr. Classic uh, Olympia. Uh, what's his name? Seabum. Uh, he deadlifts quite a bit. He's yeah. built tremendous back. I've seen it with clients. I've also, and I remember you talking about this, Adam, because you weren't a huge deadlifter until, away. until we met. And I remember you stopped doing other back exercises. Completely. Yeah, talk about that. Like yeah, what happened? For up until I got ready for competing, which was at uh, 29, 30 years old, right? So for the first 10, 12 years or more of my lifting career, um, I never deadlifted ever. 
It was all rows and pull-ups and hammer strength machines and dumbbell rows and bent over rows, T-bar rows. I mean, I did everything else. I didn't deadlift. And to be honest with you, I didn't deadlift because I, I didn't know how to really well. Mm. I didn't have the technique down. It seemed like a really difficult exercise. And I never I never had somebody mentor me or take me under their wing to teach me. And so I ignored it. Um, I finally came around to learning how to do it, started to get the technique down, um, started to see my strength go up in it really quick. And then I thought, okay, well, let me, because and the people that are huge advocates of the deadlift are, you know, they're in that camp where it's just like deadlifting is superior to all these other lifts. So, okay, well, I've done all this other stuff for over a decade now. I've never dedicated myself to this lift to see what it could do for my physique. And since I was never a strength guy first, that's kind of why I ignored it because I've always been the muscle building guy. And for this exact- And it's a powerlifting exercise, right? right? And so, you know, your, your muscle building guys don't talk a lot about it as much. Uh, or at least not most of them. Uh, but I began to do this and I thought, okay, well, a great way to really test this is to literally like drop all other back exercises and just deadlift. I was deadlifting at least three times a week, all the variations. And I would modify, you know, I wasn't going heavy every single day and technique and stuff. Um, and my back blew up and not only did my back blow up, I mean, and I had picture i wish i could still find god them. you had such a great picture i know i had a, i had some before and after pictures i used to post on my instagram when uh, when i was going through all this um but the, one of the craziest things that i thought was so significant was all the exercises that i stopped doing that i didn't do for like over a year i reintroduced later on after i got my deadlift up to 550 so i went from a guy who never deadlift was deadlifting like 135 to start off with worked my way all the way up to 550 mm -hmm. pounds that's where i maxed out at and when I got there, then I started to reintroduce those other exercises. I was stronger in all back lifts, <clears throat> significantly, not like five or 10 pounds, like significantly stronger in every other back exercise. And my back looked bigger, thicker, yeah. wider than it ever and looked this before. This speaks to force production, okay? And so this is something that I wanted to always chime in because a lot of these internet people are out there like testing everything through these muscle activation devices and, you know, how active the muscle is is specifically you know in that type of lift but if you're looking at it in terms of force production it like you can't even match it with the deadlift the deadlift like you have to generate so much force to be able to pull off that movement i keep thinking of like so i think it was in dr andrew spina he talks about force being the language of the cells it actually like determines like how they're going to react and how you need to then uh be able to build this this tolerance and this resistance to all this force, which then, you know, is a muscle building signal. This all comes from the central nervous system. So yes, there's value in hypertrophy training and isolation, but in terms of now you then being able to stretch the capacity of force production, you bring that back into a hypertrophy setting, you're going to have more well, strength control and you're going to get more out of yeah, the you, hypertrophy. You pick anybody who works out and the, the heaviest exercise that they typically can do is a deadlift. You're not going to be able to match that. And then to what Adam was saying, I, I need to reiterate that because I don't think people, a lot of people might not realize how crazy that is. Strength is, is a skill. So typically if you get good at an exercise, most of the strength gains are in that exercise. And there's some carryover to other exercises. And the more similar the other exercises are, the more carryover. For example, a bench press is going to carry over more to an incline press than it will to, let's say, uh, a barbell row, which really has nothing in common with it, right? So there's a lot of skill with, with strength, and it's very specific. You know how crazy it is to avoid doing all these exercises and just do one, come back to these exercises that you haven't done in a long time, and you're significantly stronger, that speaks- It blew my mind. That speaks volumes. Now, I do want to be very clear. This We're not saying just deadlift. All these exercises have tremendous value, and you want to program all of them to get complete development and strength and function. But the people who say, you know why people say deadlifts are not a good hypertrophy? I'll tell you right now while they say it's not a good hypertrophy exercise, because they don't know how to plug it in their programming. Yeah. When you do a body part split, where do you put deadlifts? Well, we're doing back, but it's also hips and legs. I do legs the next day. So I don't, that's a hundred percent what it is. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to program it in their workouts because it's not a pure back exercise. It involves the entire posterior chain, which includes the glutes and the hamstrings. That's the main reason. Well, the other reason too, is to the point at the very beginning of this episode, where we talked about the, the learning curve of this. Like if I judged that deadlift based off the first three to six months, I would actually come back to you guys and say, oh, T-bar rows and bent over yeah. rows yeah. and dumbbell rows are way better. 
Yeah. Why? Because it took me at least a month or two straight consistently lifting the deadlift before my technique was even good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Before I could even kind of like, the, before that switch went off, like, oh, this is how I fire this movement. Yeah. So kind of what Justin was talking about with the CNS. Then once that started to come together, I was like, oh, okay, now I got this. Now I can start to really load this thing. And then that's where it yes. And so it didn't really come on until months, eight, nine, 10, 12, a year later, did I really start to see the compounding effects of consistently deadlifting. But yep. if you were to measure it, and this is why I don't like some, when we talk about these six to 12 week studies, you take somebody who's a novice lifter and you say, go do a deadlift. And they're going from never doing it before, or go do a T-bar row, which is pretty easy to teach somebody how to do. And then let's measure in six weeks where, where are you going? You'll probably gain more from the T-bar row. Yeah. yeah and then, and the other thing, look, I'll tell you, this is, uh, you can't always tell who deadlifts, but you can often tell who doesn't deadlift. Like when you see physique competitors or bodybuilders on stage and you, they turn around, Adam and I have done this before, yeah. uh, where we'll look and be like, oh, that guy doesn't deadlift. That person doesn't deadlift. It, it, it develops a thickness. So for people <laughs> who are interested in just hypertrophy, it's a, it's an excellent exercise for developing depth of the back, in, especially the muscles that surround the spine. So when you see people with a really well-developed, nice looking back, and they have this, the back where it kind of dips into where the spine is, that those are the muscles you really get really well with, uh, with a deadlift. Lats, pull-ups are probably gonna hit the lats more than obviously than, than a deadlift, but it's just, a, it's a phenomenal exercise. It's hard, it takes practice, but it's a excellent exercise for hypertrophy. And if you don't believe me, look, here's a challenge. Implement deadlifts in your workout for a few months. Do them right for three or four months. At the very least, you're not going to lose muscle, but I guarantee you, you'll probably end up gaining muscle and you'll be- I feel like the reason why the why this gets popular on the internet still is because there's so many people that want this to be true. Yeah. yeah. And and, and there, I, it's hard and we yes. can avoid it. And I, here, I, dude, I admit I was one of those people too. I wanted that to be true too. I wanted, uh, that's why I wasn't doing squatting and deadlifting that much yeah. because I read the same stuff, heard the same shit. And I was like, yeah, see, I'm a hypertrophy guy. I'm not a strength guy. I don't need to do this bullshit. Yeah. I mean, you, you want it to be true because it's hard. It's hard to learn the movement and it's, and it works your ass to yeah. do it, man. It's yeah. not easy. So I find the only reason why I get so much traction is because so many people want it to be true so bad. And it's like, okay, if you want to just do rows and you know the rest of your life and just it, what it, a it, great exercise, nothing yeah. wrong with rows. No, and and by the way, but it ain't gonna replace a deadlift, right? And you and you can and you can build a good physique and never do those things. You're right. I had a good physique when I was 25. I didn't. I wasn't. Yeah. I didn't have a weak ass physique. Well, I'll tell you this: if you do barbell squats, uh, you know, you you can get away with not deadlifting in the sense that you'll develop some good core strength, some good lower back strength. If you don't do barbell squats and don't do deadlifts, you're, it's not a good idea. If you build a lot of muscle on your body, that was me. Yeah. I was I, I didn't I didn't squat or deadlift really all the way in my twenties. Yeah, you 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 end up losing, especially if you build a lot of muscle and strength around a physique that doesn't squat and de doesn't deadlift. There's a lot of functionality that you miss out on. Not not to mention the muscle that yeah. you miss out on. So next question is from Mason Burnt. What is the proper standing bar row form? Overhand or underhand? No, so uh. they're, they're referring to to a barbell row. Yeah, yeah, just a both supinated yeah. printer grip. You're yeah, they're both. Hmm. I, I remember. I, now underhand was nobody ever did underhand barbell rows until Dorian Yates made them popular. <clears throat> he was uh, Mr. Olympia, I think, six times, and he was known. He was the bodybuilder that brought in the current era of mass monsters. Before him, bodybuilders looked very different. He goes from second place to first place and gains, I don't know, 15 pounds of muscle. There's those famous, maybe Andrew can put this in the video, black and white photos of, of Dorian Yates, and it freaked everybody out. What the hell is this guy doing? So then everybody wanted to work out like him. And one thing that he did was an underhand barbell row. And the reason why he did it underhand was because he his training methodology, which he called blood and guts. I love the names that they do for these workouts. <laughs> He got from Mike Menser, who was a, a student under Arthur Jones, and the Arthur Jones said to do back exercises with a supinated grip because it puts your bicep in, in an advantageous position, allowed you to use more weight. So, is, is the, so the theory was if you can use more weight, then it's a better position or whatever. Now, I, I, that's not, I don't agree with that necessarily. I it's think the elbow positioning. Yeah. And if you, do, if you do an underhand grip, you're going to use more bicep than you do an overhand grip. If you do overhand grip, mm. you're going to get more brachioradialis muscle, which is this forearm muscle up here, brachialis. Which I like to give that a break sometimes because it, it definitely gets a lot of stress. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, but, and then you mentioned something, elbow position. Turning your, your hands it activates the biceps more, but it also 
kind of helps people bring their elbows tucks in. Tucks the is, elbows in. Yeah, which and is if you go, bad. if you're over the top, your elbows are going to flare out. And yeah. the further your elbows are away from the body, the more difficult the movement's going to be. You're probably mm-hmm. going to be able to load it. But I mean, they both- They're hit, both good. Yeah they, yeah, they both hit the back a little bit different. So I go back and forth between these. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I think they're, uh, it's not one is right or one is wrong. Now, the or, risk of, uh, of bicep injury is much higher with underhand uh, back exercises. In fact, Dorian Yates tore his bicep <laughs> doing- this particular exercise because it's just, it's a more vulnerable position. And if you get really strong with a barbell row, your bicep now is handling. Well, and you also will normally do more supinator, right? I can, I can row a lot more supinator. I, I do overhand, but that's because I practice overhand. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you can do more overhand than, yeah. a, oh, interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Most people can do more supinated. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. Yeah. And, I, and that's just because I've always practiced overhand. So I'm just uh, mm-hmm. much better that way, but they're both, they're both good. Um, Somewhat inter- interchangeable, um, although I would say, you know, that you get value from one that you might not get from the other one because it's a little different, but they're both really good. The one that I teach most often is overhand. It's just an easier, <coughs> you know, more natural grip for some people mm-hmm. than underhand, but there's nothing, they're both proper. They're just different I mean, I, just so you know, too, this this applies to even doing like a, a, a seated cable row. I used to play with this all the time. Oh, Sometimes underhand. I'll grab, I'll grab yeah. a, a straight bar and, you know, and row this yeah. way. And then other times I'll go over the top and wide and row with my elbows up and hit more of the upper back. Like, so there's, there's ways to manipulate this and it's not one is better than the other. I think they both have, have value for yeah, sure. Yeah, they do. Next question is from Alex SN Medic. What is better, eating three bigger meals or multiple small meals throughout the day? Yeah, this is it. We answered this a lot in the early days of, of our show. Um, whichever one works better for you. That, yeah. I mean, really, that, that, that's the bottom line. But I do think it's important that we list out who is probably going to do yes. better with one versus the other. Mm. I'll, I'll start with the obvious, which is the small meals a day works better for people who eat a lot of calories. Yeah. If you're Trying eating, bulk. yeah, if your metabolism is fast and you're eating 4,000 calories a day or 3,500 calories a day, you know, three, you know, 1,500 calorie meals, that's, that can be really tough. You're probably better off eating six, you know, 15, uh, sorry, 500 calorie meals doing it that way. And that's, by the way, why the small meals exist. Bodybuilders did it because they're eating so much food. Mm-hmm. It, I'm eating, you know, three massive meals just became a chore and it just didn't well, work we've well. We've seen this sort of trend from the bodybuilding community kind of like trickle in is like, if they're doing it, that means that's the healthy way to do it. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, and then, now, thankfully, you know, we kind of see behind the curtain of, you know, those practices and what else is in, entailed in that whole process. It's not very healthy. So, no. but it, it, in terms of trying to bulk and, and get more calories in, this does make the most sense in terms of digesting it all and being able to, yeah. uh, retain it. So I think there's another person that this works well and a client of mine that I would recommend this to too is um, some clients have a really hard time with the long breaks in between meals and they have a tendency to snack or make bad food choices. So having a meal, basically, if you have six meals in a day, you're eating every two hours, basically. Mm -hmm. So you never really get that hungry you know, or ever get that those cravings, you're already getting ready to eat. You just ate, and then it's like, oh my god, it's already two hours again. I'm eating again because there's these small portions that yep. are built out. Um, it works really well for that client. Mm-hmm. If the client is like, if they, if you know you're guilty of gra- grazing a lot on nuts and snacks and chips and things that are you can get your hands on, or if you work in an environment that you have access to all that all the time, um, I've had a lot of success with clients that putting their six meals. Uh, out like that small meal so that, you know, as soon as they have that, I want to grab those nuts. It's like, oh, it's, I'm supposed to eat in five minutes anyway. So I'll go get my meal and they eat their meal. So. Agreed. It gives them less dead time yeah. in between to be with boredom or thoughts or cravings. I agree. Yeah. Because sometimes if you only do three meals, a lot of times it, those three don't get separated by the perfect amount of hours. And there's like this six hour gap. Mm-hmm between you know two of the meals and a lot of times this is when people start to make the bad decisions or they waited that long and now all of a sudden everything sounds good and it's like the first thing that's convenient so they pull over so you know what what has been debunked is the science that used to that people tried to use before that it's more thermogenic to do the six yeah, meals like because yeah. you're stoking the fire six times what we realize now is that if you eat 3000 calories in three meals or 3000 calories or six meals the the net thermogenic effect is exactly the same yeah, than the two difference. so there's no science to support that one is better than the other it, this really comes down to a behavioral thing totally. as a coach and a trainer what i what makes me make the decision on a, does a client eat one meal two meals or six meals a day are these types of things that we're talking about right now is based off of their behavior. Yeah, now at the moment, I will not now actually, but uh, recently I was eating more small meals throughout the day. Now I've always, for, not always, but before that I would eat like three meals a day, no problem. 
But then I've you know, been building muscle. My metabolism has been speeding up. And it was just breakfast, lunch, and dinner got really big. And I wouldn't feel good afterwards. It was just too much. So I was doing the smaller meals. Well, now I'm, on, I'm in the process of trying to cut. So now I'm trying to get leaner. And it's really easy because all I got to do is remove a meal. the meals. Yeah. I just got to cut a meal out. So it makes it really easy. So really, it's, it's about personal preference. What fits your lifestyle better? Because there's some people that don't want to walk around with small meals throughout the day. And they're like, I don't want to worry about eating a lot of prep ever two or three meals. Like I just want to eat breakfast. And you don't have to. That's exactly, I mean, I mean, I'm the opposite, right? So I, I'm normally a six meal a day type of guy because I was always eating so many calories. My calorie intake is so lower now. I eat two to three times yeah. max, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes there's been days I only eat once. So you, you don't have to have, there's not like a rule on how many you have, but I think the most important that thing that you should take away from this conversation is really the, understanding who you are. Yes. Like are. Are you the person who struggles with these long hour gaps and you know you're, you have a tendency to make bad choices? Well, then maybe you will benefit from more smaller meals. Or maybe you're somebody who that doesn't bother you at all. Then fine. Then only eat two or three meals. Yep, wrong yep. with that. Now, the other part too is uh, people with gut issues, believe it or not, can fall in either category. Some people with gut issues do better with long breaks in between meals. Other people do not do well with a long break and a large meal. They do better digesting Small. a little at a time. So, okay, moral of the story, what works best for you is what your answer is going to be, whether it's three big meals or multiple small meals. Uh, besides personal preference and lifestyle, there's no benefit one way or the other when it comes to muscle building or fat burning. Next question is from Grant Satterthwaite. It seems like Mind Pump is anti-rest day. If that's the case, how could someone structure a seven day per week training plan without sacrificing performance and gain? Where does he anti rest stuff? Anti I don't know. rest <laughs> day. just make stuff up about us. I, yeah, that's I picked this because I, I was very confused. Yeah. And I wanted to see if you guys knew where they were getting No this days from. off. Yeah, no. Yeah. I, so, we're always like uh, advocating for rest and recovery. Yeah. Like, the, there's continuously. Two, there's, you could put this into two categories you have active recovery, and then you have uh, like rest, rest. Okay, so what's active recovery? Active recovery is I'm not doing a structured workout, mm -hmm. but I'm doing something that is involves some kind of movement. I'm walking or I'm hiking or I'm doing mobility or I'm doing stretching. Well, in some, our programs, I mean, we call it uh, uh, frequency builder yes. days, basically. But we've we've literally programmed those in so that way you know you're getting blood flow, you're getting that active recovery where you're moving, but it's not at an intense level. Yes. And then there's a rest day where you're pushing it to the limit and you need to do nothing. Or maybe the value of that day is you do nothing because you hang out with your family, you watch movies, or you go on vacation, in which case a full on rest day is very valuable. But the problem is I think people think an off day in order, well, at least this was me. I thought an off day meant I need to do nothing right. in order to recover better. Mm -hmm. The reality was, unless I was extremely overtrained, what helped me recover faster was to do some kind of light movement, not structure, but some kind of light movement. Well, yeah, I think, I think it's, this person probably doesn't own any of our programs because if you've, if you've ran anabolic or you've ran performance, we put uh, both in there. Yeah. These, 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 uh, one, there's yeah, there's a full rest day in yeah. both those programs, and then in addition to that, the you know quote unquote you know active rest days are a very minimal amount of work. I mean, uh, the mobility is like uh, it's like doing yoga with movement, yep. like so it's very relaxing as well as. And then anabolic, the trigger sessions is they're supposed to be yeah, low intensity. Yeah, they're ten minutes and they're with uh, they're rubber bands, and you're not supposed to get sore from it. It's not that's not the idea. So. Um, really those are those we consider those rest days. It's just like you said, Sal, I, I came in from the same camp when I was a young kid. I used to think that rest day means I should sit and lay in the bed and do absolutely nothing. Let your body recover. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because well, I mean unless you've been through the gauntlet, like you competed like right. uh multiple days, yeah. you know, multiple times in one day and your body's just trash. Right. You know, maybe in that scenario. I mean, and what what I thought was that I was, you know, I was trying to let the muscle recover as fast as possible. That was my, my thought process. Yep. And so I didn't want to burn any extra calories. I wanted any of those additional calories to go to recovering that muscle. So I laid and did nothing. We What we realize or what I understand now is that actually I'll build more muscle by activating that muscle, encouraging more blood flow and circulation, getting more nutrients and getting more movement in. Um, but it doesn't have to be intense. It's not supposed to be like a training session. It's just you uh, at moving, moving uh, yeah. throughout the day. When, people are like, oh, when should I do nothing? Well, if it improves the quality of your life. So that's number one. Number two, if you're sick or if you've trained so yeah. hard to the point where you're just, you're full of inflammation, pain, and you're like, I, I, 
I need to like sleep. I need yeah, to sleep need and to rest. down. Otherwise, like stretching, walking. I remember when when I when I first experienced this. I remember as a kid, I read this stupid article about uh, how Arnold used to do squats in the woods all day, and he would bring it like a gallon of milk. I read this. I don't remember why I read this article. But, you know, because it was Arnold, because I was young, I was like, this is the, I'm, I'm going to do, do this. And I did. I took a barbell to the elementary school that was like a half a mile away from my school, from my house. And I took two gallons of milk with me and I went there and my plan was, I'm like, mom, I'm going to come home. I'll be home by four. And I got there at like 10 a.m. And I was like, I'm going to do squats all day and I'm going to drink milk all day. It's like Arnold. I'm going to come, I'm going to get so jacked. Right. Well, I didn't, I didn't make it till four. I remember, I don't remember what time it was. I think it was like one and maybe not, maybe noon. And it got to the point where I couldn't even do a body weight squat and walking. My legs were like, Duh. and I, I was trying to walk home and I could barely make it home dragging my barbell. And luckily my dad came looking for me, picked me up in, his, in the truck, brought me home. Anyway, then I had to take the day off school the next day because I couldn't get out of bed. Well, the next day my mom was like, you're not missing school. We're going to stretch your legs out. And I thought that was the worst idea ever. No, I got to let them rest and recover. And, you know, you know, my mom's like, I'm your mom. You're going to do what I say. Well, anyway, she helped me stretch my legs out. And I remember being like, oh, my God, my soreness is like way better just from stretching. So it kind of clicked a little bit there. But, yeah, active recovery, you'll recover faster with active recovery than you will just being like bedridden. That's actually sending a signal to your body that says break things down. Unless you're sick and you actually, and you're so overtrained, you really need that. It's funny because I had surgery like in my abdomen and um, I remember like Courtney's a nurse so she's very like tough with me, but like, you know, like very uh, empathetic with everybody else. So <laughs> like, I, like it was literally the next day is she, was, I, I could have just like stayed there for, for a couple of days, just recovering. Like, Oh God, it's just like tearing me up. Had get me up to walk down, up and down the aisles. Yes. You know, it, it was, it's the best way to, to heal and to recover is to just get that light movement. I did not want to do it, but it was the best thing. For well, me. you know, in, in hospitals, they'll put, um, they put those, uh, those, those, they're like these big wraps around your legs that pump one leg at a time or whatever. And it's to keep for people who are bedridden to keep blood flow mm -hmm. so they don't get blood clots. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, active recovery, I'd say 90% of the time is what you want to do to recover. 10% of the time you, you probably should do nothing. Again, if it improves the quality of your life or like you're so hammered or you're sick, that, that's- So, I mean, the question they're asking, I guess we, we, in a roundabout way, we've answered it, but we didn't go specifically. They're saying, how could someone structure a seven day per week training program without sacrificing performance? You do exactly what we have in those programs is yeah. you have a foundational day, which is your hard train day. And then the following day right after that is always like one of active these recovery. active recovery days. And those look different in all of our programs based off of what the goals are, right? But if you were structuring one yourself, that's what it would look like. It's basically every other day is technically a rest day. But mm -hmm. what we consider rest days aren't laying in bed. They're doing mobility or doing trigger sessions, you know, or go for a hike. Like those are all ways that you would do active recovery. Excellent. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can only find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal.